Okay, I think most of us are here by now, so I think we'll begin. So let me welcome you all again, and also thank you for attending today's online session uh, from Crop Health and Protection, our CHAM. We're one of the UK's agri-tech innovation centres funded by Innovate UK, and CHAP specialises in driving forward agri-tech to support sustainable crop production alongside building networks across government, academia and industry to increase the adoption of innovation. To introduce myself, I'm Dr Alex McCormack, CHAP's Innovation Technical Lead, and I'll be your chair for the webinar today. I think you'll agree with me that we have an excellent speaker lineup for you today, and hopefully we'll provide a diverse range of viewpoints on the subject. Uh, we begin with Research Manager of Silso Spray Applications Unit, Dr. Claire Butler-Ellis. Claire will be delivering a presentation entitled Spray Application for Crop Protection, Where Are We Heading? Then we'll hear from Andy Hall, Product Manager for Sensors and Action at Small Robot Company, and Andy will be sharing robotic spraying, the opportunities, potential strategies and problems. Our final speaker is Martin Shaw, Technology Development Manager for Croda, and Martin will be talking about spray quality and the drive towards sustainable applications. Also, please note that we're recording this session and we will share it afterwards for those of you unable to make it today. You'll also receive an email which you can share with colleagues and we'll also upload to our YouTube channel. Please also keep an eye on our social media through LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram for a link to this too. And you can find us as Crop Health and Protection or CHAP and our account handle is at CHAP Agritech, all five words, all the same across those platforms. Aside from the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen, any problems or if you need to contact us, please use the chat box and our marketing and events team will be able to assist where possible. You can also use the chat box for live networking, but please ensure that any questions are placed into the Q&A section so we can see them for the Q&A at the end of the presentations. For those of you on the basis in the rest of professional registers, there are also help points available for attending this event and you can enter your details via an online of a QR code which will be available at the end of this presentation. So please stay to the very end for that. Uh, unfortunately, there has been technical problems with Neuroso, uh, but please fill in that form and we'll get that sorted out for you as soon as we can. Great. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker to the virtual stage, Dr. Claire Butler Ellis. Claire has worked in spray applications research since 1994 and he's research manager of Silso Spray Applications Unit, which became an independent R&D business in January 2016. Since then, it has continued its work for agrochemicals and agri uh, agricultural engineering industries, as well as government and regulators with unique purpose-built facilities and world-class expertise. Claire is also a fellow of the Institute of, uh, Institution of Agricultural Engineering and is a chartered environmentalist. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass over to you, please, Claire. Thank you. Right, I hope you can all see that and hear me. Um, the work we do here at Silso uh, nowadays is largely uh, you know, commercially confidential. So it's kind of difficult for me to give you any, you know, lots of interesting techie stuff. Um, I can't share it with you. So this talk is much more of an overview uh, obviously based on my um, uh, what I've learned from the, from the work we do uh, with all sorts of people. Um, it, it is a bit personal in terms of, you know, the views that they're, they're mine uh, and you may disagree with me. So uh, that, that's, uh, that could make for some interesting uh, discussions. So um, that's what I'm going to try and do. And it's a bit of a ramble. I have to be honest. I looked at it this morning and thought this isn't entirely coherent. But anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a bit of a download of my thoughts as to where spray application technology for crop protection in particular, where, where is it all going at the moment? Oh, I don't seem to be able to move my slide on. We didn't check. Let's try that. There we go. Um, so spray application of plant protection products. Um, it is very old technology. If you, uh, I don't know whether you can see my um, uh, mouse really in around. Um, the the what the, what the spray system is is moved around by has changed hugely over the years, but the the nozzles this this bit on the boom uh, hasn't really changed very much at all. Um, so it's old technology. 
but it's still essential uh, because what we're trying to do is distribute very small quantities of liquid or sometimes solids over a very large area. And it's difficult to think how you could do that uh, differently or better than uh, good old fashioned spray technology. So it's still there and it's still essential to what we do. Um, it's important to raise very early on the regulations that surround how we do this. Um, uh, and because the spraying systems that came before the regulations in practice, um, they have been developed around established technology. Uh, and there's no doubt that it does then end up slowing down or restricting innovation. We all know that. Um, the difficulty is that without those regulations, we wouldn't have plant protection products anymore. They, they, they just wouldn't be there because of the concerns about uh, environmental and human safety. Um, so we need them uh, in order to be able to demonstrate that we're using uh, pesticides safely and wisely. So if we want to develop new techniques, we're going to have to develop new regulations and that is very costly. And there's a big question about who pays at the moment. It is the industry that largely pays in the UK. Um, so very recently, all these regulations were sort of agreed across the EU. And of course, now we don't have to uh, agree everything with 27 other countries. Um, so Brexit may provide us with new opportunities, but it's kind of difficult for us to go it alone. We're a small market for some of these global com uh, companies. Uh, and so it's quite likely that even if we want to be more flexible, um, uh, it's difficult for the industry to respond to that uh, for such a small market. So what are the challenges that, that growers face? Now, I don't have my ear to the ground as well as I used to, if I'm honest, but things that come up tend to be the same uh, year in, year out. And getting the, the pesticides onto the crop at the right time remains really, really important. Um, and, you know, uh, spray operators will say there's too few spray days. Uh, and that's why uh, the spraying has developed the way it has. Work rate is really, really important and you need equipment that can cover your, cover the ground really quickly in a, uh, in a timely fashion. So I, I stole this quote off the um, House and Sprayers website. Um, which suggests that, you know, 100 hectares a day, up to maybe 150 hectares a day, um, it, it is what people want. And we need to understand why they need that. And, uh, and if they genuinely do, um, then we're going to have to keep, you know, make sure we can deliver that if, as we move to new technology. And I think that's quite challenging. Um, other challenges that we've got, product availability and the effectiveness of those products and resistance is a big component of that. Um, as we lose products because of regulation and we're all using fewer and fewer products, that resistance is only going to get worse. So what can we do to uh, improve that uh, is, is a, another big challenge. And although actually people don't tend to talk too much about challenges of labour, but uh, it, it pretty much always is a, an issue in, in most parts of agriculture and other in, industries. So, um, you know, applying pesticides is a, is a skilled job. It's, it's not something that anybody can do. Um, so if you've got somebody who can do it, you need to make sure that, that you know, that one person is as productive as they can be. Um, and again, that goes back to work rate. So um, those, are, those are the things that I feel that, that spray operators and farmers you know, really worry about. Where are the opportunities then? Um, so we've done work recently looking particularly at protected crops where they are very manual, small scale applications. And there's huge scope for, for improving this kind of situation. Um, uh, yet it's not happening. It just isn't happening. And uh, there is a reluctance to invest. And there's a re I think there's a, a, a lack of focus on these things. So if you, you know, if you buy yourself a brand new uh, arable crop sprayer, everything will be computer controlled and logged and, and very difficult to do it wrong. 
out here in these situations you know that there's no there's no automatic control the pressure is is read by a person off a gauge with a very dirty screen so you can't really see what's going on and that that um uh pointer is probably wobbling around as soon as you get the pump on so it, it does just so much scope we could we could we could put effort into this area uh, and, and do a lot better the other area where some of the new technology coming forward could be really really useful is in inaccessible locations and i'll apologize for stealing two pictures off other people's websites again um, railway what, railways is, a, is an interesting one because although it's not a difficult um, uh, place to get to in, in in many respects closing the railway line while people walk up and down with an apsac square is hugely costly so to do that with sort of uh, remotely piloted uh, 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 spraying systems is you can see the advantage of that uh, and then this this down here uh, I believe is a bracken control on the on the side of a hill and you can see there's a little vehicle there uh, steering a very wobbly path um, that's probably really dangerous and difficult and probably not that effective so finding ways of doing those things better you can see that there's a need for new technology so then if we take a bit of a step back and look at, you know, OK, UK farming as a whole has got big challenges, never mind plant protection products, um, using fewer inputs. And in, in our case, obviously, that's less pesticide, using it more effectively, becoming carbon neutral. That's going to only get more and more important. Safety, human and environmental safety. Uh, unfortunately, agriculture still has a pretty poor track record for safety. Um, uh, and while Plant protection products are very well regulated from that point of view. Um, sometimes the equipment is less so. Um, and we've got to do all of this at the same time as, if not increasing yields, certainly maintaining yields. But I think, you know, as the population, the world population grows, we, we can't just uh, expect other people to grow it for us. Um, uh, we might need to increase yields to get a better uh, food security in this country. So I've looked at, you know, how are people trying to use less more effectively? Um, and obviously there are various efforts into alternatives to conventional pesticides, which are quite interesting, but they still have specific challenges. And a lot of those challenges are in the efficacy and the speed that they can be done and the power uh, that's used to, to do it and the cost of those approaches. Um, so I've looked at, I shouldn't really bucket electrical and mechanical weeding together because they don't necessarily have the same uh, difficulties but um, uh, electrical electrical weeding uh, has been talked about for a very long time but but the, the power you need the efficacy of it um, the cost of it uh, can be a real problem and you've got selectivity issues you know with both electrical and mechanical weeding if you pick the wrong one you, you're going to kill it um, if you were uh, if you're not uh, focusing it in the right place but you know benefits certainly environmental safety is better i've always worried about human safety with some of the huge electrical charges people talk about so resistance issues are, 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 uh, are gone um so there are benefits um disease control uv light for disease control people are talking about a lot and again you've got some of the same issues the power that might be used and the cost that might be used and how efficacious it is but it does again have benefits and uh uh, it may have a niche more in protected crops than, than outdoors, but uh, uh, you know there are benefits to be gained. And then the big one is probably biopesticides. And there are lots of these on the markets, but they have difficulties as well. Efficacy has been quite an issue in making them work as, as reliably as conventional pesticides. Um, uh, and you know, big benefits and safety. Um, and one advantage is that we've got the kit already to to be able to uh, deliver these um, and so it's going to be a low cost approach but we still have challenges in actually working out how to do it best uh, and I don't think we've got there yet uh, and uh, there's not enough research going on to, to work that out um, so uh, yeah so things are happening but they're not necessarily going to solve all the problems and then may create other ones on the way so the other way we often talk about is using less more effectively is using conventional pesticides, but doing it with precision. Um, and 
I don't like the, the phrase precision agriculture. That's why I put it in uh, inverted commas, because it sort of means means everything to it to everybody. And, and we're all meaning different things when we talk about it. But in this context, I'm talking about actually uh, locating where you put the spray and not trying to deliver it uniformly across the whole field. So it depends on what spatial scale you're talking about um, for um, uh, for what sort of kit you need. So uh, patch spraying has been around forever and a day. When I first started work on pesticide application nearly 30 years ago, the patch sprayer was well under development uh, and variable rate spraying, well under development and it was commercialized soon after. It's not caught on though, has it? People may be doing it a bit. The problem is pesticides are too cheap. You might as well just spray the whole field. Uh, it's easy to do and you reduce the risk of something going wrong. So there's no, uh, at the moment, there isn't really a big, big pull to make that happen. Um, spraying either over the row or between the rows, um, uh, that's already possible with other commercial equipment. Um, and uh, maybe that will catch on, but once again, you know, it's, it's not being, it, there's not a huge pull for it, but I feel. Um, we talk about plant scale application and you know with largish plants you could do that with a conventional boom sprayer that's got uh, you know individual nozzle control um if you're getting to smaller and smaller plants that you want to uh, treat and even to sub plants you're going to have to go to nozzle techniques and uh you know we're not there yet it's really quite difficult to um uh, to deliver a very controlled dose to a small area but behind all of that, you need some other essential components and they're not all there yet. So we've got sensing and I think sensing is making huge leaps uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years and, and going forward. So that, that's coming along wonderfully. But the agronomy, the cost benefit and a systems approach uh, so that how is it going to how is it going to fit into my whole farm uh, isn't there. It really isn't there. The agronomy to support it isn't there. I haven't seen cost benefits for, for lots of these approaches uh, at all. Um, and there was, I couldn't find it. I was looking for a report that was done, I think funded by HGCA, probably 10 or 15 years ago, looking at the variable rate application. And the conclusion was, there's no cost benefit in it. So that might have changed, but somebody needs to show that it's changed. Otherwise people aren't gonna take advantage of these. Uh, these techniques that are already there. Just going to have a little talk about robots and drones because they're things that uh, you know are, are quite uh, topical at the moment. And uh, Andy in the next talk is going to talk about uh, robot spraying. So ground-based and aerial autonomous vehicles um, uh, have the potential to be able to to spray. Um, and I think the, the, the ground-based systems are going to be able to do a, a lot to improve spatial precision. But the problem we've got with them is the temporal precision, uh, the speed with which they can operate, at the moment looks likely to be compromised. So, you know, 100 hectares a day, how many robots might you need to do that? Um, uh, it's still a challenge and we have to, we have to get over that challenge. Um, aerial systems. Spatially, they are pretty hopeless at the moment from what I've seen. Um, doesn't mean that they can't be improved, but uh, it's gonna be difficult to make that work as well as a boom sprayer. Um, however, you can see the benefits. Temporal precision may be uh, a, a, a real advantage because they'll be quick and easy to deploy. Um, and certainly better than a manual application, particularly for those um, places where it's difficult to get a man in because of the health and safety implications. So they, they may have their roles, um, but uh, and I think they will have their roles, but it's finding where they can do it better than current technology, rather than trying to replace some of the current systems, which are already really quite good. So just some conclusions, and then my personal conclusions, uh, and feel free to argue with me. Um, I think currently we've got a bit of a situation where technology is, is a solution looking for a problem to solve. And they haven't really identified the problems that crop protection needs to solve. So uh, 
I think we need to kind of look at it from a different direction. Um, and certainly if there was a good cost benefit of, of some of these new technologies, we would have seen them. And it seems extremely difficult to demonstrate at the moment. Um, the agronomy to support how we use these is missing. Uh, we've got to get the agronomy in. It's, it's, it's got to do a, at least as good a job as the current systems that we've got. Um, logistics and the safety of the complete operation is rarely considered. How is it going to fit in to a normal uh, farm operation? Or how do we have to change the normal farm operation to make it work? And the promise of new technologies isn't always matched by their field performance. And that's a very tactful way of saying, actually, people are overhyping this. Um, sometimes it's wishful thinking and they've just not done the, the measurements to show whether or not what they're saying is working. Sometimes I have seen outright lies and that is really frustrating because you don't need that. You don't need farmers to be blagged into buying something which isn't going to deliver. So we've got to get the, um, the underpinning measurements, the science, the, 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 the performance uh, to match what actually people are claiming. Um, and that needs work. Um, I think we all agree that we need our regulations to be more flexible to enable us to make good developments and take advantage of these uh, new technologies coming along. But how, we, how do we do this without compromising human and environmental safety? Because those are key. The minute something goes out there and makes a cock up and kills a river or something, um, we're, we're all going to be in trouble. So we've got to do it uh, properly. Uh, and somebody has to fund that because it isn't cheap. Um, and personally, I think we should be trying to look at improving where we don't do it as well as we ought to, rather than trying to keep with, uh, compete with the best of our current technology. So I don't know how long I've spoken for, but that's, that's about it. Um, uh, and I'll um, stop sharing my screen. Thanks for that, Claire. That's really interesting. Uh, great opportunity to see where we've come from uh, and also what the future might uh, sort of make for us all, but also some of the challenges that are also faced by uh, growers and uh, the industry. Uh, also, some very interesting use cases there of uh, spray applications outside of ag uh, in some quite challenging scenarios, uh, and also in other industries. So that's really that's really great. Thank you for that. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Andy Hall from Small Robot Company. Andy has had a very career, including roles at Procter and Gamble, and retrained as a secondary school science teacher. After 18 months teaching in New Zealand, he took on a master's in mechatronics, com um, completing his dissertation with the small robot company. He's been there ever since, leading the prototyping team working on non-chemical weeding, precision spraying, soil sensing, and 5G. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to you, Andy. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me and hope you can see uh, the slides. So yes, so I've had a, had a varied career. Um, uh, so currently working for a small robot company and uh, in the very, very near future, moving to another robotics agricultural company called Tortuga Agtech. Um, following on from um, Claire's excellent presentation, I'm, I'm going to be talking about robotic spraying, the opportunities, the potential, the strategies and the problems. Um, and Claire kind of really introduced a lot of the problems that we've already um, been talking about. So um, I'm going to start with why robotic spraying. Um, so we're all after reducing inputs. Um, and there's two, two real inputs we want to reduce. One is reducing the chemical usage and the manpower. And that's going to re reduce the costs um, and increase the yield. Um, and from a small robot company point of view, we're, we really view uh, per plant farming as the way forward. So rather than treating an entire field because a section of that field has a problem, let's just treat the plants that have those problems. Uh, robots and AI give us the opportunity to save chemicals and also the environment and consequently money. Um, to do this, we need to think about what strategy we should use and what technology we need. And as Claire hinted, really, or said outright, I don't think there is one solution. Um, you know, if you're treating an entire field, the best way to do that is with a sprayer running a cheap spray over the entire field, covering that 100 hectares a day. Uh, that's going to be unbeatable. Um, but if you, want to if you want to treat in environmentally sensitive areas or you want to treat something that has specific um, resistance, then we need to kind of treat individual plants um, and really, really small areas. So 
what work have we done? Um, well, we're currently working, we've worked on three major spraying projects um, over the last three years. And that those projects, Slugbot, uh, Spraybot, and Smart Farm China. And we've worked with lots and lots of partners on there. I hope I haven't missed anybody out, but we've worked with Innovation UK, CHAP, at the Epicenter, Newcastle University, Cranfield University, NIAB, University of Strathclyde, Ross Amstead, Clare, um, and Fatenix, and lots of farmers um, in that. So let's just have a quick look back. So what's Small Robot Company is currently really focused on cereal farming. Um, and here's some of the numbers. And, and I, I hope, hope Claire accepts these numbers. Um, but uh, you know, we've, we've done quite a lot of research into this. And these, these are the numbers. And this is why we really think we need to move forwards in this particular area. Uh, cereal farming really needs our help. It's unsustainable. You can't make that much money from it. And as we've seen with the uh, Ukrainian and stuff that's going on, you know, we've got a real food security risk. Um, some kind of, kind of key numbers, pollution, fertilizers, it costs an absolute fortune. There's lots of greenhouse gas gases from farming. Um, machinery just gets more and more expensive all the time. Um, a lot of the chemicals that are put on the field are actually wasted because you're treating, um, treating crops that don't actually need that treatment. Um, and you know, with the Ukraine thing, again, you know, global wheat reserves um, are reducing and our yields are actually reducing. Um, so this is where we see per plant farming um, at the moment. We want to understand every plant, optimize that plant's care. By doing that, we can improve diversity. By diversity, we can reduce the chemicals, waste and emissions. And these are the numbers that we've come up with. Um, so we think by doing that, at the moment, we can save around about 15% on fertilizers, 77% on pesticides, and reduce the input costs, increasing the yields by about 4% at the moment. Um, and we're forecasting as we go forwards, uh, we'll be able to save more fertilizers, more herbicides, and more input costs, increasing the yields by even more. So how, how do we do that? Um, so it all starts with per plants intelligence. And we can see in the left-hand side of the screen, we've got our TOM robot. This is our TOM V4 robot. Um, with that, we're able to geolocate and analyze every plant at millimeter accuracy with around 100% coverage. And at the bottom left here, hopefully you can see my mouse moving around. It's a typical of an image that we get um, of the plant. So in here, we can see droplets of water. We can see disease. We can be able to pick up nutrient deficiency from that. Um, having all those images isn't really an awful lot of use unless you can actually analyze those images. So we use an AI to do that, um, which we'll come on to on the next slide. Um, but from this, we want to be able to treat any plant in the field differently to the one next to it. Um, initially, the fastest entry to that is by looking at what the farmers currently have. And if you've got a section control, nozzle control, or boom control, uh, we can produce a map which says these are the areas you need to spray, and more importantly, these are the areas you don't need to spray. We're working on in the future, um, and we'll talk about it, a bit more about that, is how do we actually go and spray with robots? Um, and that we, we believe that's going to give even bigger savings. Um, so, and, and at the bottom here, we can see some of our kind of models for precision spraying applications. And as Claire talked about, we've also looked into non-chemical weeding as well. And uh, as she rightly said, it's not an easy, not an easy area to work on, but it has tremendous possibilities. Um, here's a little bit more about how our AI works. We've got the image at the top left, which is taken by our Tom robot. We then upload that to um, Wilma, which is our AI. It's a cloud-based computer that can detect anything in the fields that we train it to detect. From those detections, we can detect weeds and we can produce uh, a field scale uh, map for the farmer saying, this is where your weeds are. And this then gives them the information they need to make a decision. Like, are we going to spray or are we not going to spray? Um, and this is uh, the Tom V4 robot that we're really, really proud of. Um, it's a um, modular platform. At the moment, we've, we've focused it around sensors for, uh, or cameras for detecting stuff. Um, but it is configurable, designed to be modular, so we can um, do lots and lots of functions with it. It's 
got a really low ground uh, pressure. So if you can walk on the field, our robot can drive on it. Um, and the pixel size, we get about 0.28 millimeters per pixel. So we're getting really, really good resolution. Um, from this, we've got a reliable, actionable field scale data, which can be collected in a uniform way, to make treatments for disease and nutrients much easier. Drones have the place, um, but they can't be used all the time. They, can have, they can't cover the same area that we cover, but they can cover other areas. Um, and we, we believe we're better than trapped amounts in green and green uh, because we give more precise data and we can um, give bigger chemical savings. Um, and this is an example of a, of a real field that we've surveyed, um, which would give the farmers the idea of how much they can save by using their sprayer uh, that they've got available at the moment. Uh, and it tells them, you know, how much they need to load up, how much they're going to, to use in that field. So rather than spraying the entire field, um, they're just spraying the bits where the problems are. Um, and here's some, some thoughts again about how we can make our robots um, bigger, smaller, take on different roles um, for mapping, for spraying, for, for non-chemical weeding. We've got a really uh, adaptable modular platform to be able to do that. So that's kind of the need. Um, and then as, as you start looking at what, it, what the capabilities are, you've got to start rethinking about how do you actually use the technologies that are current, currently available and how do you use those to the best effect? Um, we don't have all the answers yet, and I'm sure over time we're going to start developing answers to that. But um, I've kind of grouped it into two different strategies that you can use. Um, the first one is uh, surveying and then spraying. This is what we do at the moment. So we send a Tom robot out into the field. Uh, it goes and it surveys the field, loads all the survey data that we get into our AI, which can then look for anything that you can detect by eye. So we can train the AI to detect certain sorts of weeds, certain sorts of diseases. If an agronomist can see it, we think that we can train an AI to be able to identify that. From that, we can then produce a spray map, which then enables uh, current agricultural equipment to go out and just spray the bits that it needs to spray at the resolution it can spray. Uh, in the future, we see this being possible with a robot. So instead of uploading the spray, the spray map to a tractor, we can upload it to a robot. And with a robot, we think we can get down to a much, much smaller resolution. Um, so the advantages of, of this strategy is that the, the farmer agronomist can see that data and he can make that decision to spray. Or what we really like is the idea that he can say, actually, in this, this farm, I've only got a really, really small problem. It's only in this one area. I don't think I need to take the risk of spraying. Um, and you know, farms keep telling us that um, quite rightly, you know, they've got they're gambling every year. They don't know if they've got a disease. They're going to do the safe thing, which is if I think I've got a slice of physical disease, I'll go and spray it all off. Um, we're wanting to give the farmers the confidence to say, actually, no, I know the level of weeds or the level of disease in this field. I'm prepared to take that risk. I'm not going to put the, uh, the spray on there. Um, the other advantage of having the survey out there is it can also be part of a general survey for weeds, crop growth and everything. So you're getting lots, not just getting um, a spray map, you're getting really detailed information about what your potential yield is going to be, uh, about uh, how well did the person who your contractor plant, um, which areas did you actually miss, um, and, and, and. The more we, more we know on that, the better we get. Um, the, another advantage on going out and spraying is you know how much spray you need to mix before you go out. So you don't have any waste on that. We can say you need to load 415 litres of spray in this field. Uh, and you spray that, you don't have the disposal problems, um, and you know, uh, you know, and you can save on not having to, to load everything up. Um, and conventional equipment can be used. Um, this does have its disadvantages. Um, and um, one of the big ones is the delay between de de detection and treatment. So if it's something that moves like a slug, it's not going to be where you where we detected it because there's always going to be a time difference between taking the doing the survey, uploading it, processing it, and getting it back ready to spray. So for certain things, it isn't ideal um, because it will have moved 
Um, and if it's a disease, you know, we don't know how much it's going to spread, going to have spread. So that's the first method that we're working on. And with, with the uh, many of the projects we're working on now, we're looking at you know, how do we survey and spray at the same time? So how would this work? We have a robot. It has a camera and an edge AI on that robot with a spray. When it detects a disease or a weed um, or a pest, it can detect that and it sprays it. The advantages of this is that we have instant treatment. So if it's a pest, we get it before it moves. Um, and we have the potential to treat many things, just limited by the uh, AI that we have. Um, the disadvantages on that is how much chemical do you need to carry? So that's an issue for us. What chemicals to carry? Um, this can be got round by um, having onboard mixing. So we have a variety of different chemicals which are in a concentrated form, which are then uh, mixed on the robot and sprayed. Um, a, a big issue, and this is what Claire was talking about, we, we would really struggle at the moment to cover 100 hectares uh, in a day. That would, be, that would be virtually impossible with one robot, but we could put lots of robots on there, um, but that our speed will be slower than um, doing a normal survey and a normal detection. It would certainly be slower than a tractor. Um, the, one of the big issues we have is for each AI, it needs to be trained and it takes a lot of compute. Uh, so for, for real-time compute on that, um, even if it takes a quarter of a second from detection to saying where it is, uh, that's still quite a lot of distance that gets covered, which actually means everything gets slowed down. So you, you compute, you need to have a lot of powerful compute on board. But with the development of NVIDIA or a lot of graphics, GPU, and the development of AI that's coming through at the moment, we've, we're seeing massive, massive increases in compute and speeds that can work on that at the moment. Um, there's also a bit of difficulty around the, you know, where's the perimeter of the spraying on the detection? Um, if it's at the end of the boom, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? Do you end up spraying it twice and so on? There's a lot of thinking that needs to be done on that. Um, and there's also a lot of thinking that needs to be done on the contamination of detectors with spray. Uh, they're just some of the uh, problems and advantages, but this, this is an area that we really see uh, advancing in the future. So I've kind of hinted at some of those problems, some of the problems that are on there, but um, kind of here are some of the real, real world problems that, that we're dealing with um, as a company and also within the industry. And so some of the areas that uh, the Innovation UK projects we're working on at the moment. So the big one, or not the big one, but the really tricky one, is training the AI to detect whatever we want it to detect. It is really expensive to do that. It's really time consuming. It needs good data and it needs good compute for, especially for edge AI. You can imagine the amount of uh, images that we upload. Uh, we then have to train. Uh, we have to put a box around each detection, and each detection will will be done hundreds and hundreds of times to say actually this is a particular weed or this is a particular disease, um, and it ta it takes time and it takes expertise to do that. Um, another problem. Um, operating a robot autonomous, autonomously, um, one of the big savings you get with a robot is not having to have the person there. That then eliminates the need for speed. But um, driving a, a robot around a field, uh, taking, just taking images, is still quite complicated. You've still got to have lots of um, things in place so that robot can't hurt people. Um, if we then put uh, dangerous chemicals onto the back, that problem becomes even more difficult. So there's a whole raft of work to do on legislation, um, on British standards. So how can we do this safely and legally when we're truly autonomous? It's not an area that's just being worked on um, in, in agriculture. We're going to see more and more autonomy um, on cars on the roads. We're going to see it, well, we do see it in, in robots in warehouses. So it's not an insoluble problem, but we need to make sure that, that when we're doing this, we're doing it safely. Um, and cost effectively. Um, another problem, chemicals. Uh, the current chemicals and dose rates are really designed for field scale application. Uh, con configuring for per plant will be expensive, um, but has the potential to open up or extend chemicals that we 
we're about to lose because we're going to use them in much smaller quantities or um, develop new chemicals that will do that at different dose rates. But as Claire said, it's very, very expensive to, to develop these chemicals. But there's lots of stuff that's happening with adjuvants at the moment, and I'm sure they're going to play a really big part in um, per plant uh, spraying because of the, the ability to spread and stick. Um, well, the other, other issue is nozzles, nozzle control. Uh, nozzles are designed at the moment um, for traveling at, at six meters per second on the back of a, a tractor. Um, one of the problems is that we go down to smaller and smaller areas that we want to spray. We need more and more nozzles because we're going to have more on a boom. Um, so as we do that, we need to switch them on and off faster and faster. As we turn them on, on and off faster and faster, they get more expensive and we need more nozzles. So everything gets really expensive really quickly. Um, so that's another area that needs to be worked on. So that's just some of the many, many problems that, that we need to work on as we're going through. So in conclusion, per plant robotic spraying, we believe, and we've kind of we, we believe we've shown as well that there's massive potential savings of farmers and the environment. Um, and both, both are equally important. Um, some of these are available now using detection and then developing a spray map. We can get instant savings on that. There's a lot of work to do technically on robots, particularly around detection and on spray decision, spray precision. It's also a lot of legislative work to be done for autonomous robots to work in a field by themselves. Um, I've been working on spraying now for, th for three years, and the more you learn, the more difficult it gets. Um, spraying is really, really difficult, and we need the experts like Claire uh, to share her knowledge and to, to help us make things move forward. And she is working with us on several projects. Um, and I think now that we have the opportunity to rethink the way we treat fields, um, and move from treating fields to treating individual plants. Um, it's going to take technology to do this, but um, we're really on the cusp of actually making this happen. And this is going to reduce pollution, reduce costs and improve yields, which is just good for everybody. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Really interesting to hear more about how you've integrated multiple technologies there, uh, taking us down to that per plant level within the field and also possible impacts for future agronomy uh, and crop protection. Before I introduce my next speaker, uh, I'd just like to also remind everybody that if they can put their questions into the Q&A box below, then we'll have them ready to answer by the panel at the end of this next presentation. So now it's time to introduce our third and final speaker, Martin Shaw from Croda. Uh, Martin's based in the UK, arm of the business, and has been with Crowder for 12 years across a number of different commercial and technical roles. His main focus has been to build engagement with customers and other industry partners. And a chemist by degree, Martin's expertise lie in understanding how to apply surfactant chemistry into formulation development and delivery optimization of agricultural systems. So with that, I'd like to pass over to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Now, cheers, Alex. And yeah, it's nice to see from the uh, the previous two presentations that I think this presentation will follow on quite nicely. Um, but rather than thinking about um, how the spray gets to the field, we're going to think a little bit more about what else is built into those um, those spray systems. And yeah, Andy's mention of adjuvants um, towards the end of his presentation there was yeah a nice note that will come up hopefully um, within this presentation as well. And thinking about how does that build towards improving the spray spray quality of what is being sprayed but also thinking a lot about what are the sustainability drivers that are moving the industry towards looking at improving what we spray and, and what is applied. So just quickly, just to kind of, for those who aren't familiar with Crota, just to give a, a very brief overview of, um, of the company. Um, we are a speciality chemical company. And um, so yeah, we create, make and sell speciality chemicals into the industry. And um, we have two main sectors, um, our consumer care, and so that's personal care and home care type products. So looking at hair care, skin care, um, sun care um, type products. Um, and then within life sciences, we've got our pharma division and that's pharma with a pH in this case. Um, so they're looking at um, improved delivery of um, pharmace pharmaceutical active ingredients. Um, any of you who've had the, the Pfizer BioNTech COVID vaccine, um, you will have a little bit of Croda and floating around in your body as well, because we are part of that vaccine. Um, and then within, within that life sciences, we also have the crop protection or crop care sector where I work. 
um, and where we're looking at the improved delivery of agricultural active ingredients. Um, and in, as a company as a whole, um, we are really driven by sustainability and innovation, and that goes into um, yeah what we see as our um, our key purpose in delivering smart science um, to improve lives. So just to look at um, the crop care sector in a little bit more detail, yeah, we have the, the crop protection um, and I'll come on to, um, yeah, the, what we deliver into the industry and why that will be impactful going forwards for the future of spray applications. Um, but we do also have um, a couple of other divisions. So Incatech um, looking at improved seed delivery. Um, so looking at um, in, enhancing and achieving the maximum potential from seeds. Um, and then our plant impact division as well. They're looking at um, development of biostimulants. Um, so those products that can help to, to stimulate the plant responses um, and help them to um, mitigate um, control against um, abiotic stress um, and other, other things that could be damaging towards crop yield. So ultimately building towards improving um, the crop quality and the yields that are achievable. But looking at kind of crop protection and what we offer into the industry and how we think this will this will change going forwards. Um, when you think about yeah the agrochemical formulation that is ultimately going to be sprayed onto the field, you need to think about the development of that. And in the past, that was more about yeah getting ultimate performance from your active ingredient, doing that in a cost-effective way, but also making sure that you're differentiated from your competitors. And we see that with yeah, formulation aids that, um, that we as a company develop, we're looking at trying to improve the stability of those systems. And so stopping that formulation breakdown, which can compromise the efficacy of the application. Um, but as we move towards looking at systems where you have multiple active ingredients needing to be built into a formulation, um, or you're moving towards biological active ingredients, the challenges that you face within this, the stability of that system is going to change. And certainly with biologicals, um, maintaining the viability of those active ingredients will be a key, key challenge in the future. Um, and it was also touched, on about, touched upon by Claire about looking at what is the impact of regulations and how does that reduce the number of active ingredients that are available, but also with those spray applications, if you're looking at targeted delivery, you might be thinking about multiple active ingredients in a tank mix at the same, same time. And you need formulation aids to help improve that tank mix stability and stop that um, any um, inhibition or mitigation that might call, um, occur within that tank mix. But then also coming on to thinking about how, do we, how are we able to enhance the bioefficacy of the application as well? And this is where, yeah, we, we start to talk about adjuvants and building them into a formulation. And we see increasingly that these types of materials will be built into formulations so that we can achieve extrinsic sustainability benefits, for example, reducing the amount of active ingredient that needs to be sprayed. And these adjuvants allow us to achieve multiple benefits. So we could be looking at the spray for formation, so looking at yeah, what is the creation? What, what droplets come out of the nozzle and how can we impact um, those droplets? Then looking at how do we retain those droplets on a leaf surface, the spreading of those droplets, um, and ultimately the deposit formation of our active ingredient, and then the resulting uptake for systemic active ingredients. So looking at building these types of solutions into products in the future, will help customers, yes, to differentiate within the industry, but also begin to think about the sustainability drivers of their products as well, and those extrinsic benefits that are going to be achievable in the future. And I've talked, yeah, quite a bit already about sustainability and, yeah, why do we think that sustainability is going to be a key driver in the future? And ultimately, this comes from the consumer that you, me, anyone else, we're thinking more and more about what do we put into our bodies and what is the impact that that could have. And ultimately, for the food that we consume, that then has an impact on the farmers and how we want them to behave in the, in the crops that they're growing. Um, 
And this, there's a new term, so the prosumer. So this is someone that is far more involved in determining what they consume, or in some cases, actually, in the case of um, yeah, what they're in, um, eating, growing it themselves as well. Um, but this is forcing a lot of food companies to think about the types of data that they have available, but also increasing the transparency around the use of pesticides. So ASDA, for example, have got key parameters that they put looking at residues of active ingredients on the crops, on the um, fruit and vegetables that they are selling. It's also important that this drives through to thinking about the record keeping of on-farm practices. So yeah, Andy and the small robot company thinking a bit more about yeah, controlling what is sprayed, but also tracking that so that the consumer can be aware of what they might be eating. And then making sure that, yeah, the farmers are doing the right practices that keep the soil healthy. And that's really the lifeblood of agriculture. And ultimately, some of the most important things to think about is how do we maintain the quality of the soil? And this, as consumers, is something that is, yeah, is thought about more and more. So looking at how is Croda going to think about this? So we have a, a number of key targets um, looking towards 2030 where we have committed to being land, people, um, sorry, climate, land, and people positive. Um, and within crop care, yeah, that land, land element of that will be one of the critical things that we'll be needing to think about. Listed here, we've got some of the, the goals that we've built into those, and that is thinking about, yeah, the sustainability development goals from the UN, and how does that impact the development of new technologies? So taking the top one there, we're certainly saying that we're going to be moving towards more bio-based raw materials that we use to develop our products, but that's taking land away from the industry that could be used to grow crops. So in some ways, um, yeah, that, that could be seen as unsustainable. But we're committing that, yeah, the development, the speciality chemicals, the adjuvants, the formulation aids, they're going to in deliver improved yields and land saving benefits as a result. And that will more than compensate for the land that we need to use to grow the raw materials. And we look at the writer here, looking to think of some of those sustainability drivers that we are thinking about and what is the impact on the products that we develop. So regulations that have been spoken about already are, are gonna have a big impact on that. And microplastics is the key one that we're thinking about most keenly within Europe. And this will see the removal of certain certain chemicals, and they will no longer be allowed be able to be, be applied within the industry. So we need to make sure that we're future proofing the technologies that we have available to meet the needs of our customers, which will ultimately deliver the needs of the farmer as well. We might be thinking about improved delivery of biologicals, so that could come through encapsulation or other means of delivering or maintaining the viability of those types of active ingredients. We also need to be very aware of the regional needs and wants. And then, yeah, it's been touched upon in the previous presentations, but looking at new ways of delivering active ingredients and formulations as well, and thinking about drone applications. And this is one area that I'll touch upon. Yeah, I could have touched upon many different areas um, and the drivers that sustainability brings, but yeah, I felt it was nice to talk a little bit about drone or unmanned aerial vehicles, um, as this is one of the research areas that Croda are focused on at the moment. The advantages of, of drone applications have already been spoken about um, in the previous two presentations. I won't go into these in a lot of detail, but the same common themes are thinking about the reduced number of labor in, reduced, reduced need for labor inputs, um, the operator exposure, so taking away the operator that may be uh, applying via knapsack, Thinking about the ease of the application. So yeah, the accessibility that the gives, this gives growers to new areas and be that on hills, narrow valleys. Um, and then also, yeah, an extended application period. Um, but this comes with, with challenges that I'll come on to, but also key differences from those more common boom sprayer type applications. So you've got very low spray volumes. Um, so yeah, typically maybe five or 25 liters compared to 
yeah, hundreds of liters per hectare from a typical boom spray. And you've then also got very high pesticide concentration within that spray tank and no agitation either. So what you build into those formulations needs to be stable for those high concentrations, but also be able to operate and keep a homogenous spray tank when you don't have um, agitation delivering that benefit. So just to touch briefly upon yeah, the growth of, of drones and within the industry, we see, and um, certainly from Crota's perspective, that the Asian market is really driving um, the uptake of drone applications. And we see here with the numbers that, yeah, certainly within China, um, unfortunately, I couldn't find additional data for after 2018. We see that, yeah, the application area, a number of drones being used within that area, within that region, has been growing exponentially. Um, and just to give a bit of context, so 43 million acres. Um, acres is about two thirds the size of the UK. So we can only assume that that size has grown to well above the size of the UK at this point. Um, and then also I look to just, yeah, pull out a few bits of press releases that we've seen across the last couple of years that are looking at the growth of drone applications and why sustainability is driving this as well. So we see Certainly within a number of these that, yeah, drones will be able to reduce the pesticide use by 15%, imp improving that crop produce by 10%. Um, yeah, thinking about cost saving, cost saving, sustainability, targeted applications. And in the past, it was all about, yeah, development of equipment to allow drone applications and um, the spray, um, suitable spray applications to be made. But now we're seeing big companies like Bayer, Adamar, um, and other major pesticide um, manufacturers developing their products in bespoke ways to be able to be utilized within those drone, drone sprayers. And who knows, yeah, I think we've seen from, from Andy's presentation that, yeah, ground-based spraying um, within the UK, um, yeah, using unmanned um, robots, yeah, is growing, but yeah, will there be a growth um, in the future for yeah drone applications as well. So then, what are the challenges that that brings to um, yeah to pesticide manufacturers and ultimately to Croda who are looking to deliver those solutions to those companies? So we see with with drone applications that with that very small volume of spray um, available. In order to get the spray coverage, you need to create a very sp faint, fine spray. Um, and those are also typically applied from a much higher um, spray height as well. And all the, these two parameters increase the propensity for spray drift, so untargeted delivery of the active ingredient. So we need to think about how, ways in which we can use adjuvants to control the potential for that spray drift to occur. I spoke before about the highly concentrated tank mix systems, and there might be multiple formulations um, being built into that spray system as well. So we need to think about how do we control the stability and the formulation components to stop any, um, it, any um, negative effects from those high concentrations. And then again, yeah, looking at that low spray volume. So yeah, maintaining, um, yeah, main, ensuring that we get um, the type of coverage across the field, and also mitigating against the evaporation of those small spray droplets. Again, this builds into thinking about the use of adjuvants to give that effect more effective spreading and wetting on the leaf surface, or the use of emectants to help control that evaporation of small droplets, which may occur. And just in this final slide, um, hopefully those videos are playing for everyone. This is just showing um, some of the, the capabilities that we would utilize to look at what is the impact that adjuvants can have on the delivery and the spray quality. So we see with the water alone, you're getting that, that bounce off, that shattering, you're not retaining your droplet where it needs to be. Whereas building a surfactant or a high molecular weight polymer into that spray application we see much better 
retention on that surface and much better spreading of that droplet across the surface as well. So we're improving the delivery of our active ingredient. And if that is being utilized within a drone, we're giving that more effective coverage that can help to mitigate some of the issues with that low spray volume. So hopefully I've, um, yeah, stick to time, I think just about, um, but yeah, hopefully you've had an appreciation from this brief talk of looking at thinking about the sustainability drivers that will make all the changes to what we are spraying and how we are spraying um, in the future. And it comes back down to us as consumers being able to drive and ask for these changes to be made within the industry. Um, we've even seen, I don't know if anyone's been watching The Farm um, or Jeremy Clarkson's Farm, we're even seeing, yes, yeah, celebrities get on the back of ensuring that we look for more sustainability agricultural practices in the future. And hopefully by Proda, yeah, being aware of these drivers and yeah, an appreciation of that, the impact that ha that has on the products that we develop, we'll make sure that we're on the right side for delivering the solutions that are needed by our customers and then ultimately their customers, um, the farmers and the applicators. So thank you very much um, for, yeah, for this opportunity. And yeah, if anyone does have any questions, um, yeah, please obviously raise them now, but also yeah, please feel free to get in touch with me in the future if there's anything you'd like to discuss um, in more detail. Thank you very much for that, Martin. That's a really interesting overview of the role of formulation and adjuvants in particular uh, to not only help with crop protection products, but also support additional technologies, which is interesting. Uh, and also interesting to see the push, not only from uh, end users like growers, but also the uh, consumers and wider supply chain. So thank you very much for that. You're it's now time for our Q&A. So I'd like to welcome back all of the speakers, plus myself for your questions. Uh, for those in the audience, there's still time to add your questions into the feed, so please do add them to the Q&A box below. Uh, you can also like questions that have already been uh, asked by people by using the little thumbs up icon, uh, and these will bring them to the top of the list so that we can get back to them. Uh, welcome back, all the panellists, uh, and let's start the questions. So I've been having a little bit of a look through, uh, and I'd like to start with one for Claire from, uh, unless you've answered it already, Claire, you've been answering quite a few of them. Uh, Lorry of questions now. Yeah, sorry, James. I didn't know what the process was. So if you want to read them out again, I don't mind answering them again for everybody. No, I think that's great, Claire. I think people can see that for themselves. But I'd like to pick up on one by uh, James Clack from ADAS. Um, so James asks, uh, what changes to the regulatory framework would be needed to enable current or near release technologies uh, to deliver some of the benefits that you described, uh, in particular improved efficacy? Uh, and kind of reduced environmental impact. So, uh, I mean, Claire, what would what would the framework changes need to really look like? I, I, that's a really, really big question, and and, and I'm not going to be able to answer it. Um, uh, I don't think in this sort of forum, it, it needs lots of lots of wise heads to get around the table and and think about what needs to happen. But I think one of the most important things that we need to get to grips with is if we're not applying the whole dose across a whole field how are you going to regulate that so are you going to allow people to put a higher dose per plant uh, as long as averagely over the field it doesn't exceed the dose or are you saying you know or or, or, or the regulation is going to say no, no no it's got to be the same dose per plant as it would be if you're applying it across the whole field um, so that, to me that's the, the one that is actually preventing us or, or not in it's stopping us from being encouraged to uh, to spray on a smaller scale, um, uh, and that one I think is easily solvable. Um, but but somebody's got to say, okay, we're now going to regulate things differently, and it's kind of difficult, particularly if you go for the the sense and spray approach that Andy was talking about. That you can't do your risk risk assessment either um, locally if you don't know how much you're going to spray and where you're going to put it. Uh, you can do it after the event if you've got a map. You know, I can see that there might be a way of doing a risk, you know, a standard risk assessment on a spraying map, and then you get, can go and spray it. But if you don't know what you're going to spray, when you're going to spray it, that's the really hard thing. So, yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a ramble, but it's a really good question and it's got a really difficult answer. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Claire. I'm 
perhaps that's something you and James could maybe pick up on in a bit more detail and have that kind of conversation, or we can maybe invite others to join that as well at a later date. Um, so I'd like to pick up on some of the questions uh, further up the list, uh, particularly for Andy at this point. So Stuart Kivis uh, has asked the question uh, or made the comment more um, that sometimes it can be a bit late by the time you've detected a weed or disease to actually really get a, an efficacious control with the products on the market. So, I mean, Andy, have you got any comments on kind of um, what you're doing to try and avoid that situation? Yeah, it's 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 really difficult. Um... And you know, as we develop these technologies, we'll, we'll find different solutions. So if we're, if we're going out and sending a robot through a field, there will always be a time gap between detecting something um, and doing it. And equally, if we send a robot out into a field to go and spray stuff, we've got to know what's in that field to put the right spray on there in the first place. So it, it is a really, really difficult one to answer. I think it would probably be something like, we know by experience that at this time of the year in this field from the data from the last two or three years, this is what we'll need to send out there. Or it might be kind of combining other stuff. It might be that you, you have an agronomist who goes out there and says, actually, in this field, we know we have problems with, or I've been out in the field, I've seen we've got problems with this. We just send a, send a robot out to go and deal with, with these particular problems. Um, but I think we will develop it over time. Go on, go on Claire. <laughs> yeah, can I just chip into that? Because I think, I think sensing is making big stride so they may be able to pick things up through sensing that you can't see with the naked eye um, but even if you can't I think there will be developments with I mean I hate this big data thing you know it, it, it sounds rubbish doesn't it but but the more we can measure you know things like the environment things like you know micro environments almost you know around particular areas of the plants um, uh, and uh, sensing sensing spores coming in from other fields, you know, all of this is going to go together into a big big pot that somebody can stir around and say, right, we, we really do have a handle on the risk, uh, uh, and so let's get, let's go do stuff now before we can see it, and means that which means that people aren't spraying so much prophylactically that they're, they're doing it with much more intelligence behind that, and I think that will happen over the next ten years. Yeah, and I think the, the fusion of lots of data and AI, so weather conditions, previous conditions, phase of the moon, whatever it is, you put all those things in there and that, that gives us a prediction. And there, there is work going on, as Claire said, on, on detection, spore sampling, um, the Moderna stuff triggered by um, COVID. So there's a load of uh, edge technology stuff happening out there that, uh, that is really interesting, has a, has a lot of potential in the future for putting stuff together to say, actually, we know in this field, this is going to happen. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, both of you. That, I know that's very interesting. And uh, also just to add into that, I know, Andy, that your, your imaging platform is not just RGB as well. You're looking at other kind of spectral signatures. So perhaps we can yes. go beyond what we can all see as well, which is quite exciting. Yes. Um, so, Martin, not to leave you further, sort of left out, um, there's been a few questions, particularly around the formulation aspect. So uh, Chris, Chris Hartfield from the NFU uh, asks, are there any kind of possible impacts that uh, formulation technologies and adverts might have are on pollinators obviously we've had a lot on on pollinators and crop protection products um so uh, any comments there um if if i'm honest it's it's not something that i've seen widely researched that i, I think as you you touch on there alex a lot of the focus has been on the active ingredients in them, themselves so obviously the neonicotinoids have got the greatest focus uh with yeah with their impact to bees but we would certainly yeah it's something that we're we're, we're conscious of and aware of the regulatory changes and the impact that our products will have within that but we would typically expect the formulation inerts that we're developing yeah to be inert in their their behavior within the environment and um, but it's certainly something that we we will need to be conscious of um, and ensuring that we've got the right regulator we've got a yeah a dedicated regulatory team that ensuring that our products are are not having a negative impact within the environment as well so that that will only kind of increasing the amount of testing that we need to do in order to be able to, to license our products within the market, I think in the future as well. I also see in, in the comments that there's a few questions that pick up on this as well. So uh, again, Martin, I don't know if you might be able to answer this. Um, uh, obviously we're seeing a, a drive towards more biological based solutions like biopesticides. Yeah. Um, what formulation challenges do they present? Well, yeah, big, big formula, big challenges. Certainly if you look at um, sort of microbial based, so be them bacterial or fungal, 
in in some cases they might be they might be dead but in quite a lot of cases you're you're looking at a, a dormant spore that you need to maintain that stability and viability for ultimately ideally two years is the the typical aim so keeping that from that spore in that dormant state is is very challenging they might be hydrolytically unstable so if you int introduce water into the environment they'll that spore comes out of dormancy and you therefore you'll lose the long-term viability because it will die within the, the concentrated system so yeah we look at yeah formulation development where you're looking at eliminating that moisture from the concentrated environment so looking at oil dispersions or solid based systems and um, that yeah that takes away some of those those impacts that could reduce that viability of those biologicals for the future. Um, that's thinking about the concentrate. Then the, the, the other challenge is going on. How do, how do you effectively deliver those biologicals um, as well and maintain that viability on a leaf surface where you've got UV, temperature, moist, uh, rain events, all of those things to think about as well. Yeah, the use of the formulation technology will give that protection to the active ingredient and also ensure it stays where it needs to be. Um, and isn't washed away. Um, so, yeah, I, I could probably talk for the full hour of today of, of the challenges with biologicals, and we've certainly, it's something that we're heavily focused on at the moment. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm just aware of the time, and I, I don't want to keep people for too long, but thank you for that really interesting discussions. Uh, apologies, we haven't got through all of those questions, but I wonder if our panelists would like to see if they could answer some of those while uh, I'm kind of closing up the session. Uh, and if anybody has any individual queries that they'd like to put to the panels or, or make contact with them, uh, then please uh, either contact through the pr presentations, uh, contact details, uh, or feel, get, uh, feel free to get in touch with chat, uh, and we'll try and make that contact with you as well. So with that, I'd just like to say, sadly, it's time to, to wrap things up now, uh, and it's the end of this webinar. Um, we regularly on, host online knowledge transfer events uh, as an independent not-for-profit organisation, uh, and they're of high importance to us at CHAP. We're also about building relationships and networks to accelerate our industry's innovation journey, hopefully, as you've heard today. So what, uh, what better talks than uh, the, the, those provided by our speakers today? I'd also just like to leave you with uh, a few slides here with a bit more information. So as I mentioned before, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, we'll be recording this uh, and we can send this out to you via email so you can share with colleagues who can't be here today. Uh, we'll also upload this to our YouTube channel and we'll also post links of that to our through our social media channels. Uh, you can follow us as at Chap Agritech, all one word, uh, through LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, please follow us if you don't already. Before you sign off, I'd like to also um, just make you aware of uh, a short one-to-one -one speed clinic that we're going to offer to some of the attendees today uh, with myself and my colleagues within CHAP's innovation team. This will be an online session, so really uh, accessible uh, and an opportunity for us to kind of discuss project ideas and maybe explore upcoming funding opportunities or grant funding uh, project avenues. We'll show, make sure to match you with the right CHAP expert for your particular business or expertise uh, to really get the most out of that time. So if you're interested, uh, please register through the email at chap, uh, inquiries at chap-solutions.co.uk. If you have any questions, contact us and we can forward on to the speakers uh, or we can point you in the right direction. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us and our presenters today. <laughs>